I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Drs. Francesco Egro, Nikki Phillips, and Ira Savetsky. Enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the June 2018 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. I'm Ira Savetsky, PRS Resident Ambassador from NYU. And as always, I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Francesco Egro from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Nikki Phillips from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Scott Lifshay, Associate Professor of Plastic Surgery and Orthopedic Surgery, Director of Hand Surgery at the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, and Program Director of the Johns Hopkins University of Maryland Plastic Surgery Residency. Thank you so much, Dr. Lifshay, for joining us for this Pure Journal Club podcast. My pleasure. A quick reminder, all of the articles that we will discuss can be read for free on PRSJournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. The article we'll be discussing is Innovative Surgical Approach Using Mesh Sling for the Aging Neck by author Dr. Yoav Granovich from the Shari Tzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem, Israel. To begin, rejuvenation of the neck is a critical component to achieve a more youthful appearance. As we age, the tissues begin to descend with the gradual loss of elasticity and deflate as the bony structures and fat begin to atrophy. This results in a rectangular lower one-third of the face as opposed to the upside-down egg shape in a youthful face. There are so many techniques for the correction of platysmal banding, including plication, platysmoplasty, resection, and denervation. Furthermore, other techniques focus on submental gland resection, digastric muscle resection, subcutaneous fat removal, and or subplatysmal fat resection. The main drawbacks are recurrence, malposition, and unnatural appearance of the neck. In addition, there's a risk of salivate problems and denervation of the marginal mandibular nerve. In this paper, the authors describe a novel surgical approach to improve the aging neck that involved the use of a sling to elevate all the descending elements as a whole and resection of redundant skin as needed to create a natural and long-standing result. In this study, 10 patients, 8 females, 2 males, with a median age of 61 years old have been operated on for neck lifting with this new surgical approach using a sling. The authors used four different types of material for the sling. There was an absorbably synthetic braided mesh, such as Vicryl, which was used on 5 patients, a semi-absorbable synthetic braided and monofilament on 1 patient, and an absorbable synthetic matrix on 3 patients, and finally a biologic, biologic mesh allograft material or alloderm was used on 1 patient. In terms of their surgical approach, an incision was made on the mental crease, then on the distal half of the retroauricular sulcus. If there was excessive skin redundancy, the incision went preauricularly to the lobule and the edge of the tragus and retroauricularly to the occipital hairline. A subcutaneous pocket was dissected, which the authors show in figure one. The size of the sling was chosen by measuring the length between the retroauricular sulci and between the anterior aspect of the mandible to the hyoid bone in the midline. It was then tailored to size, and the lateral edges of the sling were sutured to the mastoid fascia with PDS. The sling was then stretched from the opposite retroauricular incision with moderate tension until a smooth appearance of the neck was created, and then the opposing lateral edges were sutured to the mastoid fascia with PDS, and finally the anterior middle edges were sutured to the mental fascia with sutures. Skin incision was done if there was excessive skin redundancy. Drains were placed in the retroauricular incisions and left in place for 24 hours. In terms of results, overall, authors report that the operations were uneventful. The mean operating time was 80 minutes in duration. 80% of patients needed skin excision due to redundancy. The authors share various post-operative images at different time points up to 40 months. They report no major complications. They report a minor complication which occurred in one patient with a semi-absorbable synthetic braided and monofill mesh. This mesh had caused stiffness of the soft tissues and surgery was required to replace it with a Vicryl mesh. All other materials were tolerated well with very good results of contour, feeling, and integration with the surrounding tissue. 80% of the patients reported an unnatural feeling of the neck during the first 10 days, but the feeling was gone after four weeks. There were no fold or ripples in any of the cases, minus the one that they had to replace. Overall, I thought this was a interesting study. As we know, the cornerstone of facial rejuvenation is a well-defined neck contour. And me as a resident, learning all the different techniques and trying to figure out which one is the best, I find it challenging as there are so many different approaches that are described for neck rejuvenation with really a common goal to minimize recurrence. In the study, the authors advocated a new approach using a supporting sling instead of direct manipulation of the platysma. One potential concern that I had is 
the risk of infection, which the authors address briefly, but I think without having a larger sample size, it'll be difficult to obtain the real numbers. And certainly an infection in this region could be a, a devastating outcome. Additionally, the author's longest follow-up is 40 months, and I think to truly evaluate the longevity of this technique, it will require a longer follow-up. In addition, uh, the authors don't really go in and explain why they chose to use four different types of meshes, and I think they would need to determine with a larger sample size which mesh would be a best fit for this operation. But as a whole, I, I do applaud the authors for trying something new to try and improve the longevity and decrease the recurrence of neck rejuvenation. Dr. Lipshay, I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts about this paper, and do you see a role for mesh in neck rejuvenation? I shared similar questions that you had as you were reading this about what is the role of an implant since so many other techniques rely, you know, work so hard to use only the native neck and lower facial tissues to create the rejuvenation. What came to my mind as I was reading this is what do we see an abdomen do when we use these kind of implants in an abdomen? And the answer is for the more absorbable ones, the vicral mesh and that sort of thing, it goes away and the contents bulge out once it's gone. Or for the more long-lasting meshes, be it the permanent ones like proline or even the biomaterial ones like alloderm and others, is it stays there, but we're not asking an abdomen to do the subtle expressive motions that we ask a neck to do. And I couldn't help but wonder, while those are very attractive looking static photos, what would this look like animated? And while patients may not say it feels funny when they move it after, uh, I think it was 10 days, the author said, what does it look like to an external observer? I think we need some more information both in terms of time and in terms of implants in either direction, meaning number one, does it stay there but then the neck moves in what may be an unnatural appearance, or two, does it not stay there and it does recur if you just wait long enough to look for it. I think it's novel and it's very interesting as a new technique and I like the idea of trying something new since everything else reported certainly comes with its share of complications but I would like to know a lot more about it before we can go about and say that the next great thing is here. I agree with everything you said. I think it is helpful, and I think people are, are starting to show more videos of their post-operative outcomes at conferences because it really does make a difference if they're animating. And, and, and certainly in today's day and age with how photos can be manipulated, and it is important to show a more animated type of image. Francesco, what are some of your thoughts about this paper? I thought the authors introduced an interesting technique in reinforcing the neck with different meshes. Similar to Dr. Lifshitz, that that's exactly what I thought was, how will these materials feel? And are they going to compromise the aesthetics? Are they going to compromise the functional result of the neck? I also wonder how the recurrence is affected. And for this reason, I look forward to their long-term results. Another concern I would have with this technique is the development of seromas or hematomas, but only larger studies will tell. I wish the authors had expanded a little more on the indications for this procedure, i.e. who is the ideal candidate, and also I wish they had expanded a bit more on their uh, skin incision technique. To Dr. Lifshay, we had discussed a little bit about mesh, and the authors described different types of mesh to be used. Is there one that you would be more inclined in using, and why? Well, of the meshes that they described, the one that intuitively to me seems the most able to accommodate animation would be the vicral mesh. Again, it's fairly thin, very pliable, and it's gone in, you know, six weeks, 12 at the most. While that may accommodate animation the most, my concern on the other side of the same coin would be, well, okay, when it is gone in six or 12 weeks, how is the longevity of their result holding up? Now, maybe it is, as the authors say, well, you put it in position, it scars in there well enough, and it does stay there. And if their long-term data shows that, then that is a major improvement. But that's what I would like to know. That's a very good point. I mean, the question is, what's going to happen once that resorbs? Once again, it would be very interesting to see longer-term results of this technique. Nikki, what were your thoughts about the paper? You know, I've really enjoyed this discussion so far. I agree with the points that have been made. I think one of the questions I had was, this is sort of more of a larger scale question and just how we 
define and analyze results in aesthetic surgery. Um, you know, I, the article didn't really define how these results were deemed to be satisfactory, and they definitely did not include any data about patient satisfaction with the outcomes. And so I guess this is my question, which is more of like a larger philosophical question, which is what role should patient reported outcomes play in aesthetic surgery and how should we be defining our outcomes? That is a great question. And it really challenges uh, kind of the tenets of aesthetic surgery that to a large extent, perhaps more than anything else we do in plastic surgery, what the patient says counts in terms of is it a good result and when we measure things like cervical mental angle and other things like that that we can make charts for and show photos with lines on them for, are we missing the greater picture of what the patient wants? I'm not sure how well we will do when we say we want to try to get somebody's subjective sense of their own aesthetic quantified, which is what we're doing when we make things like the breast cue, the body cue, and other things like that that have attempted to standardize outcomes, which is not to say that we shouldn't try. I think we should attempt to make things like that. Um, but as we try to apply those concepts towards aesthetic surgery and certainly head neck aesthetic surgery, I think it's gonna be very challenging to find a uniform opinion across groups of people, across cultures, across nations of what does it mean to have a good result? What does it mean to look good when I'm done healing from the surgery that I've just had done? I, I think there, I think it is a good goal and something we should work towards, but I think it may be harder than some of the areas that we've had some success in generating a standardized, validated, patient-reported outcome measurement device. I really agree with that. I think it's a big challenge, but I think potentially an important one. So thank you. As a whole, one of the downfalls of residency, you know, we have six years, the first several years we're just sort of getting on our feet and by the time we're really doing cases at a chief level, you know, we're shipped off to the next place and it's really difficult to, for us to see our long-term results and that's whether if it's we're doing hand surgery, craniofacial, you know, micro or, or anything. So, and particularly aesthetics and I think it's, it's, it's hard for us to critically analyze anything long term until we're out there practicing and I was just wondering if, if Dr. Lifshay when you first got out I mean um, how often would you bring patients back to, to you know see, obviously depend on what you're doing but uh, you know I, I, I would want to see let's say if my aesthetic patients I'd want to see them when I first get out as much as possible or every year and just to get an idea of what I'm doing. Um, do you have any way that we could, or test when, when we get, get started um, or what we could do better in residency um, to sort of get a better idea of long-term results? I think you've hit on what is probably the most important thing, which is just self-directed effort and interest, you know, for your own sake to know that you are delivering uh, what you think you're delivering to your patients, absolutely. Um, for as long as the patients are willing to come back to see you, I, I would encourage you to, to check in on them once a year uh, if you're willing to do that. If you're having an aesthetic practice, there's no cost to the patient other than time. Um, and so uh, if they're willing to do that, I would definitely do that. I would definitely be critical in a constructive way about your outcomes. What could you be doing better? Now, some things that you'll have to do anyway as part of your board preparation will encourage that kind of behavior anyway. You know, there as you prepare your books for your board cases, they're going to be expecting many months of outcome. Uh, and obviously, your collection period is only for a year. And so uh, even a case selected from the start of your first year will only have at most a year of outcome. Uh, but the idea is, is getting you in good habits of doing that. Uh, I absolutely would encourage you to do that, especially for something where the patient is going to judge how you did over time, not just once they're done healing, but even, you know, several years down the road, maybe more than several years down the road. I've been myself just trying to critically analyze any of my own clinic patients and try to keep in touch with them. Even if they could send me a photo down the line, I think it, it is helpful. I think with that, we'll end our discussion. I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you, everyone, again, for a great discussion. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share with your colleagues and friends and rate us in the Apple iTunes store. 
Also, remember to tune in to the two other two articles we'll be discussing on this month's podcast. And finally, please join us this month for our monthly journal club on Facebook, where we will be able to interact directly in real time with this month's selected articles authors. Go ahead and like the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Facebook page if you have not yet done so already. And it is there where our monthly journal club takes place. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Lipshay, for joining us. My pleasure to be here. 